Welcome to Catholic Light. Join me, Becca Doherty, each week as we shed a little light while keeping the conversation light. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Catholic Light. Thanks for joining me. On today's episode, we will discuss the ninth and 10th commandments and wrap up part three, which is exciting. And then that will leave us with part four, which is Christian prayer. And as we've talked about before, the first section of each part goes through a general discussion. So part four will generally go through prayer. And then section two of each part specifically gets into something pertaining to that overarching topic. So the catechism in speaking of Christian prayer will specifically go through the Our Father line by line in part four, section two. So Catholic Light Podcast listeners, we have about 10 episodes left. So I'm I'm projecting about two and a half, three months to go. And then you will have completed the Catechism of the Catholic Church, reading slash listening to slash contemplating, learning about, thinking about, hopefully implementing in your life a little more, more particularly, concretely, the catechism or kind of cliff notes, cliff notes of the teachings of the Catholic Church entrusted to her from Jesus, by Jesus Christ. So God bless you. Congratulations. Way to persevere. And here we go. Let's persevere a little further. So we'll talk again about the ninth and 10th commandments. The ninth commandment uh, says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And then commandment 10 says, thou shalt not uh, covet thy neighbor's goods. So these two, as we'll read towards the end of our reading selection today, which is paragraphs 2514 through 2557, the ninth and 10th commandments together um, kind of summarize all of the commandments. So not lusting after, envying um, that which is not ours or not meant for us, but putting God first and then allowing all of creation to uh, kind of flow from that, come come to us from the God who, who wishes to bless us with each of these people and things in their proper time and proper ordering. So here we go. So we'll hit on a couple of different things. Um, the first of which is greed. And so when I think about greed, I think about a time years ago, I gave a talk. Um, my parish at the time was hosting a, spe- a speaker series on the seven capital sins. And uh, Father Matt, a priest at the parish and a former colleague of mine who my often quote, had asked me to give the talk on greed. And recall, this was the priest. This is the priest who talks about how sin is something that wounds us, hurts us, it's harmful to us. And so in trying to get those sins by the grace of God and by our own effort, get those sins out of our lives and live more virtuously rather than viciously. So virtue is opposed to vice. And so we strive to live virtuously, not viciously. Um, he, I would say, came up with, but really according to the tradition summarized, the the medicines for each of the seven deadly sins. And so to be healed of and strengthened against committing again the sin of greed, he proposed um, the the medicine of generosity. So if we can give of ourselves, give of that which has come to us, that for which we have worked, um, if we can can give to those in need or, you know, those whom we love or maybe don't love as well as we should, the, the people entrusted to us, uh, whether that's family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, etc. If we can strive for generosity, practice generosity, that will heal us and help us, help strengthen us against the sin of greed. So I'm giving this talk on greed and I read that passage from the scriptures where Jesus says it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And oftentimes, um, you know, people will will interpret this as, oh gosh, I can't have that much money or that much wealth or else I won't be able to get into heaven. But one of the interpretations of this passage is as follows. Um, at the time of Jesus, there were often these, these big walls that surrounded cities or parts of cities. And the opening through that wall Uh, was referred to as the eye of the needle. So you had to pass through the eye of the needle to get into the city to get past this this big thick wall. And so when people were traveling 
by camel or with camels who were holding uh, lots of stuff. In order to enter the city, to pass through the eye of the needle into the city, the camel would have to kneel down so that the person could unload the parcels, packages, things um, stacked and tied on top of the camel, unload those things. The camel would then stand up, pass through the eye of the needle, and then the person would, would load those things back up or start to you know, sell, disseminate, give away, whatever the things he or she was carrying into the city. And so the, the imagery there is used to illustrate this. It's not that uh, if we are rich, if we have wealth, money, belongings, we can't get into heaven, that those things, um, you know, must be gotten rid of or those things are barred from heaven. But the, the message through this analogy is that we need to be detached. We need to um, be able to kneel down and let go of these things at any moment, realizing that, that God in heaven is much more important and God willing when we enter heaven – we won't need those things. Those things will be of no use to us anymore. Um, so again, it's not that these these things bar us from heaven, prevent us from heaven. Um, but if we're carrying them around, if we're attached to them, well, then they they weigh us down. They you know take up our brain space. Um, oftentimes, they cause worry and anxiety when it, when we think of you know. Either how can I make more money to buy this or achieve that or, God forbid, if, you know, the stock market goes down or crashes, you know, will I lose this or that? Um, and so Jesus invites us, calls us, commands us to be detached from these things, to recognize that, that these things are gifts that have come to us either unmerited or merited by our hard work. And we realize that we're able to work because God has given us the gift of our lives, the gift of... Um, you know, arms and legs that work and brains that, that can uh, navigate these things and achieve these things so as to make money, so as to provide for our family and, and those things we would like to do. But again, it's not like rich people don't get into heaven and poor people automatically get into heaven. Uh, the, whole, the whole point of this is that we need to be detached. We you know, are grateful for these things when we have them. When we don't have them, we keep on living our lives. You know, we keep on we keep on praising God for, you know, the other good things in our lives if they're not necessarily, you know, wealth or material items. So anyway, I'm giving this talk. I come to find out later that there's a gentleman in the audience who happens to be very wealthy, and he had never heard this message before and was very relieved. And so afterwards, you know, he was thanking me like, I never understood this. I always thought that, you know, if I had money or wealth, I should kind of be ashamed by it or like I had to get rid of it before the end of my life. Um, I never, you know, heard this interpretation. So then after that, the the church took up a free will offering um, to pay. I got a stipend as a speaker. And then basically the the group that comes to hear your talk tips you. So this gentleman put in this huge tip and all of a sudden I felt so strange, like, uh, like this feels funny. I'm teaching you about letting go of money and now you're giving that money to me and ah, Jesus, I'll just give it back to you. Whoever needs it, take it. Ah. So again, recall that if, if sin wounds, we need the medicine to be healed and strengthened against committing that sin again. And in this case, the, the medicine to greed is generosity. Scripture talks a number of times about God being the divine physician. So Jesus says in the New Testament, I have come not for those who are well, but for the sick. So we read, we read again and again that he, that he comes for the, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, those who were um, kind of like the high water marks at Jesus's time of, of sin and, um, you know, professions that were, were considered disreputable and in, and in need of, of help and healing. So Jesus comes for the sick, all of us, because we are wounded by original sin and therefore have concupiscence or this tendency to sin. So pre-original sin, um, our, our minds and our hearts, our bodies, our souls, our intellects and our wills, every dimension of our humanity was integrated or one beautifully put together whole. Original sin, when Adam and Eve commit original sin, uh, that our humanity is wounded um, it's hurt as they turn away from God, who is truth and beauty and goodness, life and love. Our humanity is fractured, hurt, in need of repair. And that wounded 
humanity gets handed on. And so we all inherit a wounded humanity. The good news is that Jesus Christ suffers and dies to save us, to open the gates of heaven, to heal us, put us back together. Um, but still, there's that that little wound of concupiscence, that tendency towards sin, where it's, it's easier uh, oftentimes not to do the right thing than to do the right thing. It's easier just to fall into vice than to strive for virtue. And so as we embrace these medicines, for example, generosity when it comes to greed, um, we'll talk about gratitude when it comes to envy, those virtues um, are salves for our wounds. Uh, they repair us, strengthen us, help us be put back together and become the more integrated human being God originally intended us to be. And so when it comes to a practical application, I'll, I'll continue to, to beat the tithing drum um, and say that tithing is, is just a great way to practice generosity. So tithe, which means a tenth of our earnings, um, is put aside and given back to God through others who need it. Now recall that God does not need our money, just like he doesn't need us to pray. He doesn't need us to worship him. He doesn't need us to obey the Ten Commandments. He's just fine. Um, but he invites us to these things, these practices. He commands us to do these things because it's good for us. So it is good for us to tithe, to take a tenth of our earnings and set it aside, recognizing that um, there are others who are much more in need than I am, and um, that it is good to give, as the scriptures say, it is better to give than to receive. And um, as we give to others and help those in need, they are helped, but we too are, are made better, are made more whole, are made more happy. And so as we are generous, it helps us to be detached like that camel that kneels down and has all the, the burdens unloaded from its back, it helps us to be detached um, and as a, free, as a result frees us. So in our reading selection today, we'll read in paragraph 2536, he who loves money never has money enough. He who loves money never has money enough. This comes from the Roman Catechism, which was published in 1566 after the Council of Trent. And it just points to the fact that we have this, this infinite desire within us. You might may have heard people say, you know, every human heart has a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. Um, but we have this infinite desire within us, and if we don't fill it with the infinite God, if we don't allow the infinite God to fill that infinite desire within us, well, then nothing else will satisfy, whether it's money, honor, um, even, you know, good, I mean, these are good things, money and honor, um, but, you know, good human things like our human relationships, family, friendship, um, doing works of charity, if, if we try to fill that infinite desire within us with anything that's finite, um, we will be left wanting, we will be left unsatisfied and realize that it's never enough, never enough, never enough, as, uh, what was that, The Greatest Showman says. Never, never, never enough. Okay, so, so the, the same thing that's quoted from the Roman Catechism, he who loves money never has money enough. You could insert anything in there. He who loves to an infinite degree, or he who loves as the highest thing in his or her life, wealth, honor, pleasure, the relationships of others, never has that thing enough. And so tithing is a very practical thing that frees us. Um, it detaches us so that, you know, when money and honor, and perhaps certain relationships are taken away, um, we continue to turn to the Lord and realize that happiness and fulfillment that he has for us. Um, our happiness is not contingent on those finite things. And as we're generous, it makes us more generous and let's say nimble so that when, maybe it's not a, a money situation, but someone down the street needs a meal. Um, someone needs a house to stay in for a few days, someone needs a ride somewhere, someone needs babysitting for a few hours, then our response, because we've been practicing generosity through tithing, is, of course, I'm ready for this. You know, I've, I've made space in my life for this so that, again, I'm nimble. I'm ready for it. Sure, whatever you need. Because I'll just speak for myself. Oftentimes, I'm generous in the ways that I'm most comfortable or that I've prepared for or that I have time for. And so if something kind of comes out of left field, like, could you do this or can I have that? I'm like, uh, I have to think about it for a moment. 
Um, whereas if I if I practice tithing, again, a very like real physical in my face kind of thing, um, then God willing, it will make me more um, more ready to be generous in other dimensions of my life. Also, as a sidebar, it's good to have boundaries. <laughs> so my mom would always say growing up, um, Jesus was not a doormat. So to be a Christian, to be generous, doesn't mean, um, you know, you turn the other cheek in the sense of like, oh, yeah, whatever anybody asks you to do or say or, you know, help them with X, Y, and Z, like you must say yes because you're a Christian. No, Jesus was not a doormat. And uh, that's where prayer and discernment comes in where we, we ask God to help us use our rational intellects, our free wills, and discern what we are capable of at the moment. So we're called to be generous, um, but God also gives us rational intellects and free wills to discern our, with his grace, by his grace, our particular circumstances, and uh, know, come to know, to what he is calling us and to what he is inviting us to say no. 2514, paragraph 2514 says, St. John distinguishes three kinds of covetousness or concupiscence, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. In the Catholic catechetical tradition, so the teaching tradition of the church, the ninth commandment forbids carnal concupiscence or like bodily um, disintegration, and the tenth forbids coveting another's goods. So the ninth deals with lusting after a person or a body, whereas the tenth deals with lusting after belongings or envying the belongings of another. 2515 goes on to say, etymologically, so at the root of the word concupiscence, concupiscence can refer to any intense form of human desire. Christian theology has given it a particular meaning. The movement of the sensitive appetite contrary to the operation of the human reason. So movement of the sensitive appetite, um, the, the senses desire things, and our rational intellect kind of orders those desires or assesses those desires and says, you know, this is good, this is bad, or even these are all good, but this needs to come first, and this needs to come seventh, this comes last, you need to do that before you do this. Um, and what the catechism is saying here is we often know that we shouldn't, we know with our rational intellect that we shouldn't desire, let's say, in you know, accordance with the ninth commandment, the spouse of another or lust after another person we see, whether we're married or unmarried. Um, but our sensitive appetite, the, the desires within us as human persons um, want that or are attracted to that. Paragraph 2515 goes on to say, the Apostle St. Paul identifies it with the rebellion of the flesh, quote unquote, against the spirit, quote unquote. Concupiscence stems from the disobedience of the first sin. So concupiscence or this inclination towards sin is a wound, a hurt, a leftover from original sin, from the first sin of, of man and woman. It unsettles man's moral faculties and without being in itself an offense. So to be concupiscent is not an offense in and of itself. It's a disposition of our wounded human nature inclines man to commit sins. So we as human beings um, who have received a concupiscent, a wounded human nature, because Jesus suffered and died to atone for our sins, the original sin and all the sins that we have committed, we can, by the grace of God and um, our own human effort, live a virtuous life despite our concupiscent nature, despite that inclination within us to sin. And the, the truth is, the reality is, the more we strive for virtue, the more we live virtuously, the easier it becomes, um, the better we get at it, like so many other things in human life such that despite our concupiscent human inclination to sin, we can live virtuously in a way that makes it easier to then live virtuously. And as we continue to live virtuously, it becomes easier to live more virtuously and on and on. Paragraph 2516 then talks about how man and woman are composite beings or integrated beings of spirit and body. We don't and we can't separate the spirit from the body or the body from the spirit. We are both. Our humanity includes both in an integrated way. However, there exist certain tensions within 
the human person, a certain struggle of tendencies between spirit and flesh develops. But in fact, this struggle belongs to the heritage of sin. It is a consequence of sin and at the same time a confirmation of it. It is part of the daily experience of the spiritual battle. So this is the the experience about which St. Paul speaks in his letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verse 15, when he says, What I do, I do not understand, for I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. Again, what I do, I do not understand, for I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. I have committed, you know, 50 times not to gossip, and yet here I am, you know, in this group of friends or a group of neighbors or a group of class moms. Why am I gossiping? I've tried to fight against this. You know, I have committed again and again. I'm not going to do this. Um, So why do I find myself back in the same situation? And St. Paul says that's because of our concupiscent nature. For I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. But then again, the good news is when we, with our intellects, come to know Jesus and our free wills, uh, accept him, invite him into our lives, he gives us the grace to start to overcome that. He gives us the medicine of uh, virtues to overcome that viciousness and start to do, and then eventually, God willing, do again and again that which we want, that which we strive to do. Paragraph 2518 says, The sixth beatitude proclaims, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart refers to those who have attuned their intellects and wills to the demands of God's holiness, chiefly in three areas. So first, our our intellects and our wills are attuned to God's, the demands of God's holiness. I don't know about you, but when I hear, um, blessed are the pure in heart, I kind of zero in on that word purity, and oftentimes, maybe most of the time, I associate purity with bodily things. But here the catechism is talking about um, our intellects and our wills, so these spiritual dimensions of the human person. And what scripture goes on to say, and then those who write about the scriptures go on to say, is that purity in heart deals with every dimension of the human person. So again, we can't separate spirit and body, intellect and will, this part of our life and that dimension of our life. But we are made to be integrated, not disintegrated, human persons or these composite beings. So pure in heart refers to those who have attuned their intellects, so what we know, and wills, what we choose, to the demands of God's holiness, chiefly in three areas. So first, charity. Second, chastity or sexual rectitude. And then lastly, love of truth and orthodoxy of faith. There is a connection between purity of heart, of body, and of faith. So we can't separate out what part of our humanity is is meant to be pure or f- the purity for which we're going to strive. Okay, I'm, I'm going to strive for purity in my body, but maybe not purity in my thoughts or purity in what I watch and what I think about. What the catechism reminds us here is that purity pertains to the whole human person. And if one uh, dimension of our humanity is lacking in purity, it's going to affect the other dimensions. If we're striving for purity in one dimension, then it will help perfect and purify the other dimensions. So then there's this beautiful quote from St. Augustine. He says, The faithful must believe the articles of the creed, so that by believing they they may obey God. By obeying may live well, by living well, may purify their hearts, and with pure hearts may understand what they believe. So he brings it full circle. So that by believing, so with our our intellect, they may obey God. We may first know with our intellect and then choose with our wills to obey God. By obeying, we may live well. So that, that knowledge and that obedience will then bleed over into the way we live our lives. By living well, our hearts will be purified. And then with pure hearts, we go back to square one, we may understand what we believe. We may understand the faith to which we ascribe what we profess. How beautiful is that? And as I read this, I think about so many students who who asked me over the years, well, as long as I'm a good person, can I get into heaven? And I would immediately ask them, like, what does it mean to be a good person? Like, to be good involves first knowing what's good and then choosing what's good. And then those choices um, 
come out in your daily life. So with your intellect, are you knowing, let's say, the Ten Commandments? Let's say, keep holy the Sabbath. Are you then choosing with your free will to go to Mass, to obey that commandment? So let's carry that example through... Uh, St. Augustine's quote here, the faithful must believe the articles of the creed. So we, we know with our intellect the articles of the creed. So I believe in the Ten Commandments um, that God has commanded us to keep holy the Sabbath. I know that with my intellect. By believing, they may obey God. So I know that with my intellect, I then choose with my will to go to Mass on Sunday. By obeying, may live well. So in going to Mass on Sunday, what I gain from going to Mass, so a uh, connectedness with God, um, oftentimes receiving him in the Eucharist, although if you're not disposed to receive him in the Eucharist, um, you can still, you know, you, you keep holy the third commandment by, by just showing up to church, even if you don't receive. There's a gentleman in our parish who is just so on fire with the faith, loves the Catholic faith, but he's in basically the circumstances of his marriage keep him from receiving the Eucharist. And yet there he is. He goes to daily Mass and, you know, stays in the pew rather than receiving the Eucharist. But he is is so faithful, um, so persevering, so disciplined in his practice of the faith that, that God is already blessing him and I'm sure will will continue to bless his marriage in a way that, that God willing, he'll be able to receive the Eucharist one day. Okay, so by obeying, may live well. So we go to Mass on Sunday. We're connected to the creator of the universe. We come into community union with the body of Christ, that is going to affect our day-to-day, how we then go out from church and live our lives. By living well, we may purify, uh, by living well, may purify their hearts. So what we gain from, from that Sunday Mass, that weekly keeping holy the Sabbath, it's affecting our day-to-day, um, purifying our hearts, and with pure hearts, we may understand what we believe. So we come to understand more deeply, perhaps, why God tells us to keep holy the Sabbath, um, and then how that affects uh, the rest of our, the living out of our faith. And so because God is infinite, God who is truth, there is always more to learn, more to understand, more to know, and more to love. And so this cycle of uh, purity of heart affecting each dimension of our humanity can just go round and round from now until eternity because there's always more. There's always, as a priest friend of mine said, an abyss of love and life in God that the, the, the depths of which cannot be plumbed. So when I would hear that question or hear people say, like, as long as I'm a good person, I think I'll, you know, I'll get into heaven or I think I should be able to get into heaven, it would make me sad because I would think, like, of course, like, God wants you in heaven even more than you want to be in heaven. He wants your ultimate happiness and fulfillment. But in the meantime, like, you're missing out on so much because oftentimes we equate, um, let's say, modern society equates goodness with being nice. So I don't go to church and I don't pray, but I'm nice to people. I don't like ruffle feathers or I don't call people names. Um, I periodically will get the drink for the car behind me, you know, in the, let's say, the Starbucks uh, drive through um, I watch and listen to mostly appropriate things and I haven't killed anyone. So like, I'm good. And it's like, yes, those are all good and nice things, but there is so much more that God has for you, not just you know, the other side of heaven, but even now. And so be open to that, embrace that, um, give it a try. <laughs> Speaking of, and I haven't killed anyone, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I was basically in a position where I had made a choice. And because of my choice, I did not feel comfortable receiving the Eucharist uh, the next time that I went to Mass. I wanted to go to confession first. And so it just happened to coincide with the Holy Day of Obligation on All Saints Day. And so I decided to you know, to go to Mass to fulfill the obligation. I wanted to go to Mass anyway, but I didn't have an opportunity to go to confession before that. And so as I approached, I went up in the communion line for a blessing. I put my you know, cross my hands over my chest. The priest gave me a blessing. And just as I was rounding the corner to come back to my seat, my sister and my three nieces um, were in the front row. And so I scoot in with them. They're like, hey, Becca. And so my one niece, Cecilia, who's also my goddaughter, you know, just just starts 
starts uh, starts with the questions, like low key whispering, uh, whisper shouting. Aunt Becca, I saw you didn't receive the Eucharist. What what's going on? What did you do? Um, I mean, was it really that bad? Like, you, I mean, J- Jesus forgives you. What? I mean, you, you could have received. I don't. I, what do you, I don't get. <laughs> so my sister's going, knock it off, stop it. Shh. Okay, be quiet. So you know, we finish out mass. Love you guys. See you later. Well, my sister says that tells me later that you know they went home, and my niece just just really really persisted in it. Like, what do you think Aunt Becca did? I mean, um, okay, she didn't kill anybody. (laughs) I was like, good, good. Um, And then proceeded to guess what sin I had committed that would keep me from receiving the Eucharist. (laughs) So my sister's detailing this for me afterwards. And I said, you know what, this is um, funny and humbling. And maybe this is how I should do my examinations of conscience from now on, rather than, you know, just asking the Holy Spirit, like, enlighten my heart, enlighten my mind. How have I failed you? What have I done? And what have I failed to do? I should just line up my kids and my nieces and nephews and say, okay, I'm going to confession. What should I confess? Go. <laughs> and then see what they say. <laughs> Gosh. So if you ever want um, an opportunity uh, for humility, clarity, um, maybe also, I mean, some of the sins she generated, I was like, oh, didn't ever think of doing that. That's interesting. Um, you know, just ask your kids or nieces and nephews what they think you should confess in confession. <laughs> so again, we are made to be integrated wholes. The human person is made not to be compartmentalized or disintegrated, but to have our intellects, our wills, our bodies, our souls, all part of one beautifully integrated composite whole. And so it would be weird if I said, you know, I'm unfaithful to Dan, but I'm such a good mom to our kids. Or I beat our children, but I go to daily mass. Or I don't go to mass except for Christmas and Easter, but I donate a ton to charity. So those good things are good, but the unconverted parts of my life uh, take away from that goodness. And so if we allow uh, true purity of heart. We allow God to to work that true purity of heart into our minds, our bodies, our souls, our intellects, our free wills. Um, what am I missing here? Every dimension of our humanity. Then the the good gets better, and the the bad gets less bad. <laughs> such that God willing, um, that the the remnants of of badness, the remnants of sin and and evil in our lives are are purified and our whole is strengthened and illuminated. Also, as that purity of heart works its way through the different dimensions of our humanity, um, we're literally purified in that some things that maybe we thought were good, uh, we realize actually are not. So I think of the cultural admonition, like, be nice. Um, As we go to church and we learn the scriptures and understand our faith more deeply, we realize that, or we come to know, that there are certain things we shouldn't be nice about. We shouldn't smile at or, you know, nod our heads in agreement with. Um, We saw this, you know, just a a couple weeks ago with the gospel reading where Jesus goes into the temple and drives out the money changers with whips and cords to the point of which... Um, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees start saying, so tradition tells us that it's at this moment um, that the Sanhedrin starts saying, like, "Mm, this guy's got to go. And then Christ starts taking those steps towards Calvary. So pure in heart refers to attuning our intellects, that by which we know, and our wills, that by which we choose, to the demands of God's holiness. Paragraph 2519 goes on to say, The pure in heart are promised that they will see God face to face and be like him. Purity of heart is the precondition of the vision of God. So again, before we we enter the gates of heaven, God willing, uh, like that camel, we have to kneel down, unload the burdens, in this case, unload that which is not pure of heart, not pure in our intellects, our wills, our lives, um, so that we can enter heaven. The catechism goes on to say, even now, and I love this about our faith, uh, so that happiness, that fulfillment is not something that, you know, is, is just a reward on the other side of heaven, but, but the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It starts now. So the catechism says, even now it enables us to see according to God, to accept others as neighbors. 
It lets us perceive the human body, ours and our neighbors, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, a manifestation of divine beauty. So again, the, the ninth commandment forbids us from coveting our neighbor's wife or lusting after after others. And that might even be our own spouse. So um, we shouldn't lust after, which is to um, desire a part of the person rather than the whole person, whether that person is our spouse or not. And again, by the grace of God and our, our own knowing and choosing, if and when we're able to do that, then the divine beauty is manifested in and through that person. We see even more perfectly how awesome this other person is and not just uh, you know, dimension of that person's beauty or goodness. And then paragraph 25, 31 in the in brief section, again, sums that up by saying purity of heart will enable us to see God. It enables us even now to see things according to God. So to see not just just a part, a compartment, a piece, but the whole human person, um, whoever that person may be. The Catechism then moves into Article 10, which covers the Tenth Commandment. Paragraph 2534 says, The Tenth Commandment unfolds and completes the Ninth, which is concerned with concupiscence of the flesh. It forbids coveting the goods of another as the root of theft, robbery, and fraud, which the Seventh Commandment forbids. So the Tenth Commandment, which says don't covet or lust after envy, the goods of others, um, the Catechism says that this, this lusting, this envy, this desiring uh, something of another or desiring another not to have a certain thing is really the root of the seventh commandment, which is thou shalt not steal. It then goes on to say, lust of the eyes leads to the violence and injustice forbidden by the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment is thou shalt not kill. So lust of the eyes leads to violence and injustice, which is the, at the heart of disobeying the fifth commandment. Avarice, or greed, like fornication, originates in the idolatry prohibited by the first three prescriptions of the law. So recall that the first three commandments have to do with putting God above all else, all others, and all things. And so greed, um, which is particularly addressed in the Ninth and Tenth Commandments, um, is at the heart of disobeying the first three. And so, in summation, the Tenth Commandment concerns the intentions of the heart. With the Ninth, it summarizes all the precepts of the law. So if, if by the grace of God, we can get the Ninth and Tenth Commandments right, we will have the grace, the ability to live out the other eight. If we can invite God into our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls, to root out that, that covetousness, that greed, that avarice, that envy, which wants... Um, which either lusts after another person or lusts after envies um, and others' belongings, if by the grace of God we can root that out, well, then we are, we will have, well, then it will be easier to live the other eight commandments. 2535 goes on to say the sensitive appetite. So those, those things within us which desire, food, drink, sex, et cetera, leads us to desire pleasant things we do not have. So for example, the desire to eat when we are hungry or to warm ourselves when we are cold. These desires are good in themselves, but often they exceed the limits of reason and drive us to covet unjustly what is not ours and belongs to another or is owed to him. So these desires are all good, but they need to be properly ordered. And so when they are disordered, they exceed the limits of reason. So this harkens back to that quote about, you know, we, we know what is good with our rational intellect, but then our, our desires either run contrary to that or disorder that, whereas this desire should be seventh, but we have it placed first. And so if we put God first, or I should say, if we allow God to be first, because he is first <laughs> over and above all things, then those other desires, needs, wants are properly ordered, or he helps us, he gives us the grace to see their proper ordering um, in the human life. You might be familiar with Father Larry Richards. He's, I think he's a diocesan priest from the Pittsburgh area, and he's one of those Catholic personalities that you'll often find um, perhaps in the, the lighthouse media display in your, your church lobby. And so I came across, when I was teaching high school students, I came across this great talk he gave on confession. It was about a 10-minute 
10 minute video on YouTube and it was from, he was giving a, a men's conference before and this talk came just before all the men had the opportunity to go to confession. So he gives this talk on the 10 commandments where he kind of bing, 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 flies through the commandments. And he said, uh, towards the end, he said, God will give you what you love the most forever. So God, who loves us and respects our free will, will give us what we love the most forever. He goes on to say, and if you have chosen anything besides God, then you have chosen hell. So God will give you what you love the most forever. And if that thing we have chosen to love the most is anything but, but God, then we have chosen hell. Why is that? Because if we put God at the top, we allow God to be at the top, we get everything that comes along with him. But if we put something that is below God, something that's finite, well, that finite thing cannot satisfy our infinite desire for God. And so if, if God's at the top and let's say, you know, money is a couple rungs down, I put money first, well, then I miss everything that's, that's above the, the wealth rung of the ladder. And so I miss all the goodness that's above it. If I put honor, pleasure, all good things at the top, or that, that rung is the top for me, Again, I miss everything that, that's above that rung. If I put my relationship with my family and my friends, good, beautiful, holy things at the top, well, then I miss what is actually above those things. And those finite things cannot sustain the infinite desire. So God will give you what you love the most forever. So let's make that our homework for the week. Let's prayerfully consider and then observe our actions, observe our schedules, observe what we you know, do and think and feel, what takes up our headspace this week um, to determine what, what is it that I love the most? What do I devote the most time and attention and money and energy towards each week? Um, and is it, is it God? Is he at the top there? Or is it something else? And if it's something else, Jesus, give us the grace to honestly look at that and and start to situate that thing, that desire, that relationship uh, within our relationship with you or under you who are first, you who are at the top of the ladder and then properly order all the rungs below. So come Lord Jesus. All right, let's wrap up um, our discussion by talking about a, a few more things under the 10th commandment having to do with envy, versus its medicine, gratitude. So paragraph 2538 says, the 10th commandment requires that envy be banished from the human heart. Envy can lead to the worst crimes. Through the devil's envy, death entered the world. St. John Chrysostom, uh, one of the doctors of the church, goes on to say, we fight one another and envy arms us against one another. If everyone strives to unsettle the body of Christ, where shall we end up? We are engaged in making Christ's body a corpse. We declare ourselves members of one and the same organism, yet we devour one another like beasts. Paragraph 2539 goes on to say, Envy is a capital or one of the head sins. It refers to the sadness at the sight of another's good and the immoderate desire to acquire them for oneself, even unjustly. So the immoderate desire. Our desires might be good. We see things that other people have, houses, cars, clothing, whatever, and we might desire it as well. It's good. Those things are good and beautiful and helpful. But the immoderate desire might be so focused on achieving, attaining that thing to the detriment of other things in our lives. Or as the catechism here says, we might be sad at the sight of another enjoying those goods or seek to acquire those goods even unjustly. And so as Father Matt says, it is gratitude that is the medicine for this capital sin. So the more we practice gratitude, the more we practice virtue, the better we get at it. St. Augustine, excuse me, St. Gregory the Great quotes St. Augustine uh, in this way. St. Augustine saw envy as the diabolical sin. From envy are born hatred, detraction, calumny, joy caused by the misfortune of a neighbor, and displeasure caused by his prosperity. And so as we practice gratitude, um, the, the envy will be rooted out of us. Um, the wound caused by the envy will be healed. And again, the more we practice virtue, the easier it becomes to practice that virtue. And so I think we're fortunate in that we live in a time, let's see, maybe like the last 10 to 
25 years where a lot of public personalities uh, talk about practicing gratitude. So I'm thinking of Oprah talked about um, having a, a gratitude journal. I had a friend in college who had a, a gratitude wall or a portion of her wall devoted to writing things for which she was grateful each day. And it's one of those things that, again, like like any other thing in life, at first it might be like, I don't know what I'm grateful for. Am I grateful for anything today? Um, but we just put pen to paper or, you know, finger to our smartphone and put it in a note on our phone. The more that we recognize the the beautiful gifts and blessings from the day. Uh, the more that we are grateful and recognize that we are grateful for these things, the more grateful we become. And that gratitude leads to our happiness, our fulfillment, and helps, again, root out envy and helps to heal our humanity from the wound caused by envy. St. John Chrysostom is quoted again in paragraph 2540 as saying, Would you like to see God glorified by you? Then rejoice in your brother's progress, and you will immediately give glory to God. So let's look around at the people in our lives and rejoice in the good things uh, after which they're striving, the, the little progress, however big or little it might be. Let's cheer them on. Be grateful for it because it's leading to their happiness and ultimately to greater healing in the body of Christ. Um, but then, by again, by practicing gratitude, it leads to our own happiness as well. And as we practice gratitude, we become uh, detached from the things that we think make us happy or even do make us happy. We realize that they are blessings, but they might be momentary. They are momentary and fleeting uh, in terms of the eternal God who, who will satisfy the, the deepest desires of our hearts. Paragraph 2547 says, Abandonment to the providence of the Father in heaven frees us from anxiety about tomorrow. Trust in God is a preparation for the blessedness of the poor. They shall see God. While discussing the ninth commandment, the catechism covers the beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then while discussing the tenth commandment, so ninth commandment says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Tenth commandment says you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. While discussing the tenth commandment, the catechism touches on the beatitude that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, or for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And... Um, the poor in spirit, the phrasing poor in spirit deals with detachment. So again, we don't have to literally be poor in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, but we must be detached from things in that we enjoy them while we have them. And when we don't, we still praise God for the goodness of our lives and the goodness of creation. And so paragraph 24 excuse me, 2547 says this, the Lord grieves over the rich because they find their consolation in the abundance of goods. Let the proud seek and love earthly kingdoms, but blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It goes on to say, abandonment to the providence of the Father in heaven. So this um, attitude or disposition of entrustment, Lord, I entrust myself, my life, my family, my friends to you, uh, to the providence or providing of the Father in heaven. This abandonment frees us from anxiety about tomorrow. Trust in God is a preparation for the blessedness of the poor. They shall see God. So once again, we the rich can enter heaven. We don't have to be poor to enter heaven, but we do need to be detached to recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Um, and the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This abandonment to the providence of God, this detachment from earthly goods leads to our happiness again, not just in the next life, but life even now. Because it's not just in heaven we can enjoy communion with God, but even now we can come into communion, union with God, he who is life and love and truth and beauty and goodness. The, this portion of the catechism ends then with a, a beautiful, another beautiful quote from St. Augustine, the saint most quoted in the catechism of the Catholic Church is St. Augustine, um, where he talks about uh, communion with God in this life and then perfect communion with God in heaven one day. So paragraph 25, 50, and we'll end the first half of our episode with this quote, says, There will true glory be, where no one will be praised by mistake or flattery. True honor will not be refused to the worthy nor granted to the unworthy. Likewise, no one unworthy will pretend to be worthy, where only those who are worthy will be admitted. There true peace will reign, where no one will experience opposition either from self or others. God himself will be virtue's reward. 
He gives virtue and has promised to give himself as the best and greatest reward that could exist. I shall be their God and they will be my people. This is also the meaning of the apostles' words, so that God may be all in all. God himself will be the goal of our desires. We shall contemplate him without end, love him without surfeit, praise him without weariness. This gift, this state, this act, like eternal life itself, will assuredly be common to all. So come, Lord Jesus, give us the grace to live the ninth, tenth, and all the commandments well. Please help us to be detached from earthly goods, to place you first, to recognize that you are first, and that all good things then come to us with, in, and through you in accordance with what's good for us and in their good and perfect timing in accordance with your will. May your will be done in us and through us. Please help us to strive for virtue, to turn away from vice, and to allow you to give us the medicines of gratitude and generosity. Help us to grow in these virtues so as to combat the sin in our lives and to strengthen us against committing them again. We thank you for loving us, having a plan for us, and for walking with us each step of the way. We offer this up in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll take a brief break. Return on the second half of the episode to read paragraphs 2514 through 2557. Thanks for sticking around. You are listening to Catholic Light. Thank you for joining me each week as we read through the Catechism of the Catholic Church and discuss some of its beautiful teachings. Hi, and welcome back. We'll now read Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 2514 through 2557. Article 9, the Ninth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his ass or anything that is your neighbor's. Everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. St. John distinguishes three kinds of covetousness or concupiscence, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. In the Catholic catechetical tradition, the Ninth Commandment forbids carnal concupiscence. The Tenth forbids coveting another's goods. Etymologically, concupiscence can refer to any intense form of human desire. Christian theology has given it a particular meaning, the movement of the sensitive appetite contrary to the operation of the human reason. The Apostle St. Paul identifies it with the rebellion of the flesh against the spirit. Concupiscence stems from the disobedience of the first sin. It unsettles man's moral faculties, and without being in itself an offense, inclines man to commit sins. Because man is a composite being, spirit and body, there already exists a certain tension in him. A certain struggle of tendencies between spirit and flesh develops. But in fact, this struggle belongs to the heritage of sin. It is a consequence of sin and at the same time a confirmation of it. It is part of the daily experience of the spiritual battle. For the apostle, it is not a matter of despising and condemning the body, which with the spiritual soul constitutes man's nature and personal subjectivity. Rather, he is concerned with the morally good or bad works, or better, the permanent dispositions, virtues, and vices, which are the fruit of submission in the first case, or of resistance in the second case, to the saving action of the Holy Spirit. For this reason, the Apostle writes, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That's Pope John Paul II. Purification of the heart. The heart is the seat of moral personality. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication. The struggle against carnal covetousness entails purifying the heart and practicing temperance. Remain simple and innocent, and you will be like little children who do not know the evil that destroys man's life. The Sixth Beatitude proclaims, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart refers to those who have attuned their intellects and wills to the demands of God's holiness, chiefly in three areas, charity, chastity, or sexual rectitude, love of truth, and orthodoxy of faith. There is a connection between purity of heart, of body, and of faith. The faithful must believe the articles of the creed so that by believing they may obey God, by obeying may live well, by living well may purify their hearts, and with pure hearts may understand what they believe. That was St. Augustine. The pure in heart are promised that they will see God face to face and be like him. Purity of heart is the precondition of the vision of God. Even now, it enables us to see according to God, to accept others as neighbors. It lets us perceive the human body, ours and our neighbors, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, a manifestation of divine beauty. The Battle for Purity 
Baptism confers on its recipient the grace of purification from all sins, but the baptized must continue to struggle against concupiscence of the flesh and disordered desires. With God's grace, he will prevail by the virtue and gift of chastity, for chastity lets us love with upright and undivided heart. By purity of intention, which consists in seeking the true end of man, with simplicity of vision, the baptized person seeks to find and to fulfill God's will in everything. By purity of vision, external and internal, by discipline of feelings and imagination, by refusing all complicity in impure thoughts that incline us to turn aside from the path of God's commandments. Appearance arouses yearning in fools. And by prayer, I thought that continence arose from one's own powers, which I did not recognize in myself. I was foolish enough not to know that no one can be continent unless you grant it. For you would surely have granted it if my inner groaning had reached your ears and I with firm faith had cast my cares on you. And that's uh, St. Augustine. Purity requires modesty, an integral part of temperance. Modesty protects the intimate center of the person. It means refusing to unveil what should remain hidden. It is ordered to chastity to whose sensitivity it bears witness. It guides how one looks at others and behaves toward them in conformity with the dignity of persons and their solidarity. Modesty protects the mystery of persons and their love. It encourages patience and moderation in loving relationships. It requires that the conditions for the definitive giving and commitment of man and woman to one another be fulfilled. Modesty is decency. It inspires one's choice of clothing. It keeps silence or reserve where there's evident risk of unhealthy curiosity. It is discreet. There is a modesty of the feelings as well as of the body. It protests, for example, against the voyeuristic explorations of the human body in certain advertisements or against the solicitations of certain media that go too far in the exhibition of intimate things. Modesty inspires a way of life which makes it possible to resist the allurements of fashion and the pressures of prevailing ideologies. The forms taken by modesty vary from one culture to another. Everywhere, however, modesty exists as an intuition of the spiritual dignity proper to man. It is born with the awakening consciousness of being a subject. Teaching modesty to children and adolescents means awakening in them respect for the human person. Christian purity requires a purification of the social climate. It requires of the communications media that their presentations show concern for respect and restraint. Purity of heart brings freedom from widespread eroticism and avoids entertainment inclined to voyeurism and illusion. So-called moral permissiveness rests on an erroneous conception of human freedom. The necessary precondition for the development of true freedom is to let oneself be educated in the moral law. Those in charge of education can reasonably be expected to give young people instruction respectful of the truth, the qualities of the heart, and the moral and spiritual dignity of man. The good news of Christ continually renews the life and culture of fallen man. It combats and removes the error and evil which flow from the ever-present attraction of sin. It never ceases to purify and elevate the morality of peoples. It takes the spiritual qualities and endowments of every age and nation, and with supernatural riches, it causes them to blossom, as it were, from within. It fortifies, completes, and restores them in Christ. In brief, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The Ninth Commandment warns against lust or carnal concupiscence. The struggle against carnal lust involves purifying the heart and practicing temperance. Purity of heart will enable us to see God, it enables us even now to see things according to God. Purification of the heart demands prayer, the practice of chastity, purity of intention, and division. Purity of heart requires the modesty, which is patience, decency, and discretion. Modesty protects the intimate center of the person. Article 10, the Tenth Commandment. You shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his ass, or anything that is your neighbor's. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Tenth Commandment unfolds and completes the Ninth, which is concerned with concupiscence of the flesh. It forbids coveting the goods of another as the root of theft, robbery, and fraud, which the Seventh Commandment forbids. Lust of the eyes leads to the violence and injustice forbidden by the fifth commandment. Avarice, like fornication, originates in the idolatry prohibited by the first three prescriptions of the law. The tenth commandment concerns the intentions of the heart. With the ninth, it summarizes all the precepts of the law. 
the disorder of covetous desires. The sensitive appetite leads us to desire pleasant things we do not have. For example, the desire to eat when we are hungry or to warm ourselves when we are cold. These desires are good in themselves, but often they exceed the limits of reason and drive us to covet unjustly what is not ours and belongs to another or is owed to him. The Tenth Commandment forbids greed and the desire to amass earthly goods without limit. It forbids avarice arising from a passion for riches and their attendant power. It also forbids the desire to commit injustice by harming our neighbor in his temporal goods. When the law says, <clears throat> you shall not covet, these words mean that we should banish our desires for whatever does not belong to us. Our thirst for another's goods is immense, infinite, never quenched. Thus it is written, he who loves money never has money enough. That's from the Roman Catechism. It is not a violation of this commandment to desire to obtain things that belong to one's neighbor, provided this is done by just means. Traditional catechesis realistically mentions those who have a harder struggle against their criminal desires, and so who must be urged the more to keep this commandment. Merchants who desire scarcity and rising prices, who cannot bear not to be the only ones buying and selling so that they, th they themselves can sell more dearly and buy more cheaply. Those who hope that their peers will be impoverished in order to realize a profit either by selling to them or buying from them. Physicians who wish disease to spread, Lawyers who are eager for many important cases and trials. That is also from the Roman Catechism. The Tenth Commandment requires that envy be banished from the human heart. When the prophet Nathan wanted to spur King David to repentance, he told him the story about the poor man who had only one ewe lamb that he treated like his own daughter, and the rich man who, despite the great number of his flocks, envied the poor man and ended by stealing his lamb. Envy can lead to the worst crimes. Through the devil's envy, death entered the world. We fight one another, and envy arms us against one another. If everyone strives to unsettle the body of Christ, where shall we end up? We are engaged in making Christ's body a corpse. We declare ourselves members of one and the same organism, yet we devour one another like beasts. That's from St. John Chrysostom. Envy is a capital sin. It refers to the sadness at the sight of another's goods and the immoderate desire to acquire them for oneself, even unjustly. When it wishes grave harm to a neighbor, it is a mortal sin. St. Augustine saw envy as the diabolical sin. From envy are born hatred, detraction, calumny, joy caused by the misfortune of a neighbor, and displeasure caused by his prosperity. That's from St. Gregory the Great. Envy represents a form of sadness and therefore a refusal of charity. The baptized person, person should struggle against it by exercising goodwill. Envy often comes from pride. The baptized person should train himself to live in humility. Would you like to see God glorified by you? Then rejoice in your brother's progress, and you will immediately give glory to God. Because his servant could conquer envy by rejoicing in the merits of others, God will be praised. That's also St. John Chrysostom. The Desires of the Spirit The economy of law and grace turns men's hearts away from avarice and envy. It initiates them into desire for the sovereign good. It instructs them in the desires of the Holy Spirit who satisfies man's heart. The God of the Promises always warned man against seduction by what from the beginning has seemed good for food, a delight to the eyes, to be desired to make one wise. The law entrusted to Israel never sufficed to justify those subject to it. It even became the instrument of lust. The gap between wanting and doing points to the conflict between God's law, which is the law of my mind, and another law making me captive to the law of sin, which dwells in my members. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Henceforth, Christ's faithful have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They are led by the Spirit and follow the desires of the Spirit. Poverty of Heart Jesus enjoins his disciples to prefer him to everything and everyone and bids them renounce all that they have for his sake and that of the gospel. Shortly before his passion, he gave them the example of the poor widow of Jerusalem, who, out of her poverty, gave all that she had to live on. The precept of detachment from riches is obligatory for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. All Christ's faithful are to direct their affections rightly, lest they be hindered in their pursuit of perfect charity by the use of worldly things and by an adherence to riches which is contrary to the spirit of evangelical poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The Beatitudes reveal an order of happiness and grace, of beauty and peace. Jesus celebrates the joy of the poor, to whom the kingdom already belongs. 
The word speaks of voluntary humility as poverty in spirit. The apostle gives an example of God's poverty when he says, for your sakes, he became poor. That's St. Gregory of Nyssa. The Lord grieves over the rich because they find their consolation in the abundance of goods. Let the proud seek and love earthly kingdoms, but blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Abandonment to the providence of the Father in heaven frees us from anxiety about tomorrow. Trust in God is a preparation for the blessedness of the poor. They shall see God. I want to see God. Desire for true happiness frees man from his immoderate attachment to the goods of this world so that he can find his fulfillment in the vision and beatitude of God. The promise of seeing God surpasses all beatitude. In scripture, to see is to possess. Whoever sees God has obtained all the goods of which he can conceive. It remains for the holy people to struggle with grace from on high to obtain the good things God promises. In order to possess and contemplate God, Christ's faithful mortify their cravings and with the grace of God prevail over the seductions of pleasure and power. On this way of perfection, the spirit and the bride call whoever hears them to perfect communion with God. There will true glory be where no one will be praised by mistake or flattery. True honor will not be refused to the worthy nor granted to the unworthy. Likewise, no one unworthy will pretend to be worthy, where only those who are worthy will be admitted. There, true peace will reign, where no one will experience opposition either from self or others. God himself will be virtue's reward. He gives virtue and has promised to give himself as the best and greatest reward that could exist. I shall be their God, and they will be my people. This is also the meaning of the apostles' words, so that God may be all in all. God himself will be the goal of our desires. We shall contemplate him without end, love him without surfeit, praise him without weariness. This gift, this state, this act, like eternal life itself, will assuredly be common to all. In brief, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Tenth Commandment forbids avarice arising from a passion for riches and their attendant power. Envy is sadness at the sight of another's goods and the immoderate desire to have them for oneself. It is a capital sin. The baptized person combats envy through goodwill, humility, and abandonment to the providence of God. Christ's faithful have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They are led by the Spirit and follow His desires. Detachment from riches is necessary for entering the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I want to see God expresses the true desire of man. Thirst for God is quenched by the water of eternal life. This brings us to the end of our reading selection, the end of our episode, and the end of part three of the catechism. Way to go. Um, Between this week and next week's episode, please pray for me. I'll be praying for you. And in the meantime, God bless you. Thanks for joining me this week on Catholic Light. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your family and your friends, and connect with me through Facebook and Instagram. I'll see you next week, and in the meantime, God bless you.